In rhetorical studies, we call the use of this intertextuality. How one text or object affects the meaning of another. In the 1950s, Pepsi was losing the soda war to Coca-Cola. Its three largest campaigns had just failed and they were looking for a way to reinvigorate their brand. They did market research and found out that whereas Coke was showing people enjoying their product, Pepsi was highlighting its value for the money with their slogan, more bounce for the ounce. So during the 1960s, they set out on a campaign to retool the meaning of Pepsi by infusing it with things young people do. Young people bowl, young people play sports, and most importantly, young people drink Pepsi. If you listen to the lyrics of the radio ad, it actually says, when you say Pepsi, you're putting yourself among those who like their leisure. By saying this, as well as putting these pictures of youth and vigor alongside this message, the author is actively shaping the meaning of the text that is the Pepsi brand by introducing an intertextual casual association with youth and young thinking. And after that point, their work is done. If they can get you to think of youth when you think of Pepsi, we already associate youth with coolness. Before you know it, that association has rubbed off on Pepsi and has changed the complete meaning of the brand. Pepsi literally equaling young. But as we know, this was a time of great change in America. As the tide shifted in favor of civil rights in this country, so did their print ad marketing. Pepsi took intertextualization farther than any other company had before. In taking the nation's temperature, it was able to repurpose the phrase for those who think young to be a stand-in for those who are progressive thinking just by placing it alongside black couples instead of white couples. It may be hard to envision now, but in a time where Loving v. Virginia had just passed, where there was civil rest and riots in many urban communities around the nation, we must make no mistake featuring blacks in their marketing materials when they didn't have to, when it might even have been seen as a risky move. This was a political act, as well as a prescient marketing ploy. This new text, the images of black families, added another dimension to their For Those Who Think Young brand, because it began linking Pepsi with what was already starting to happen in people's minds. It was able to tap into the zeitgeist of those changes and waves of acceptance and ride those waves all the way to the bank. And to think, all this layering of meaning just to sell something as simple as a soft drink. It's amazing that through the sheer semiotic force of intertextualization, a mere drink can become a stand-in for the whole zeitgeist of the 1960s. That in our minds, Something as simple as a soft drink could become synonymous with something as abstract and unrelated as young thinking. Now it's time for a quick question. In the book that we've read for this week, Dr. Barry Bremen says that texts urge us to attribute meaning to our own experiences. Yet at other times in the book, he emphasizes that texts function as a mouthpiece for our culture. Would you say that the images presented in the previous slide are examples of text functioning as a mouthpiece for changes already happening in our culture? Or do they function as texts that urge us to attribute meaning, a certain kind of meaning by the author, to our own experience? You can pause the video at any time to answer. Now that we've covered intertextuality and how a symbol can be imbibed with the meaning of an almost totally unrelated text, let's talk about where we see this phenomena most in our everyday life. Let's look at the logo. A logo is a single image that can stand in as the expression of an identity. 
Before we talked about how a text like Martha Stewart can be flattened and consolidated and captured accurately by the right colors, typography, and shape. In 2008, Pepsi announced its brand would no longer be handled by ad company BBVO Worldwide, effectively dissolving a partnership that had spanned many eras of print work. If a logo can be thought of a holder of meaning, their logo had always reflected the cultural zeitgeist. The ornate swirls of their first logo, signaling the exuberance and dizzying sense of change at the beginning of the second industrial revolution. And each era after that, they slowly changed and modified their style and typography to capture the prevailing national sentiment. The red, white, and blue capturing the exceedingly patriotic sentiment after World War II. Its literal bottle cap design capturing that 1950s penchant for straightforwardness after the confusion of over a half a decade of war. But, after the 1990s, PepsiCo paid Arnell Group $1 million for the development of a new millennial logo that again captured the sentiment of the time. In 2008, we were in the grips of one of the greatest depressions we had ever known. Yet in their survey of millennials, they discovered that despite all of this negativity, they felt an optimism that the next four years would be better than the last. And so PepsiCo's semiotic branding of these ideas through the visual vocabulary of shape, color, and line began. But, Across the nation at the same time, a young senator from Illinois was also trying to tap into a zeitgeist of his own. We were brought in specifically to do the identity um, as Mode was developing some additional material at the very outset of the campaign. Everything was primarily typographic. Uh, there were no real logos uh, to speak of. And um, for Senator Obama, that all worked very nicely with the idea of doing something very different with uh, the identity for the campaign and the graphic language that was developed. We always, from the start, we're, we're very jazzed about this as a possibility, that it in, in fact it could stand alone as a symbol of support for the candidate. And the one thing that we changed about it, originally the stripes were kind of uh, symmetrically um, expressed across the horizon there, and um, as we went into final refinements, we decided that giving it a little bit more dimension, a little bit more motion, ways to enter into it a little bit more for the viewer was uh, was a better way to go. So this was the final the final version that we handed off to the to the campaign. Logo wouldn't have worked unless it stood for something real, and um, uh, you know no matter how good a, a, a logo it is, no matter how well executed it is, if it doesn't stand for something that means uh, means something to people, then it's not going to work. When Pepsi's new logo was released, bloggers wrote that it looked a lot like the one being used for Obama's presidential. Because after all, a logo, if it's a really good one, over time can become a lodestone for all the feelings that remind you of that brand's identity. And as the new Pepsi campaign was lent quick equity by employing similar rhetoric and style to the Obama campaign, do you ultimately think that it bolstered the message of Pepsi? Do you think that this periling of rhetoric of their image ultimately persuaded you as a consumer to accept Pepsi's long-time premise.
that they are for those who think young. Question two. Are the semiotics of those associations right underneath the surface of images enough to persuade you to reject or keep a certain mindset? As we've just discussed and demonstrated, Pepsi has done a masterful job over the past 100 years of identifying itself as a youth-oriented brand through symbols and images alone. Just as if we look at the Obama campaign, they, through their visual rhetoric, have convinced us that they are a brand that is designed around the idea of change. Still not convinced that the signs and symbols around us play a part in how we enter into the world? That just by being greeted with the same type of images year in and year out have an effect on the decisions that we make? Well, that's your prerogative. But maybe the next video will get you to think about the way our mindset is affected by the images around us in a different way. for Auntie, the oldest they all. She rocks all us children to sleep in her shawl. D is for Daniel, who tends to the doll. He took care of Massa way back for the war. F is for Felix, who won't do no work. He's lazy and shiftless and ready to shirk. Z is for Zonia, chunky and small. But here come the missus, so I guess it's them all. Mammy, there ain't no way to wash clothes. What you all need is rhythm. What, 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 what do you all mean, rhythm? <laughs> I'll show you what I mean. The Mammy, the Piccaninny, the Coon, the Sambo, the Uncle. Well into the middle of the 20th century, these were some of the most popular depictions of black Americans. Rumbly up there! Rumbly up there. She rubs and rubs the knuckles right on down to the nub, yeah. By 1941, when this cartoon was made, Images like these permeated American culture. These were the images that decorated our homes, that served and amused and made us laugh. Taken for granted, they worked their way into the mainstream of American life. Of ethnic caricatures in America, these have been the most enduring. Today, there's little doubt that these images shape the most gut-level feelings about race. When you see hundreds of them in all parts of the country persisting over a very long period of time, they have to have meaning. They obviously uh, appeal to people. They appeal to the creator, but they appeal also to the consumers, those who read the cart look at the cartoons or read the novels or buy the artifacts. It's not just that it's in the figurines and in the, you know, the coffee pots and so on. It is that we are seen that way, perceived that way, even in terms of public policy. And that our lives are lived under that shadow. And sometimes we then even become to believe it ourselves. Blacks don't really look like that. So why uh, is it so appealing to people to think they look like that and to pretend they look like that and to like to look at icons that look like that? 
You look at them often enough, the black people begin to look like that, even though they don't. Um, so that they've had a great impact on our society. They therefore tell us both about the inner desires of the people who create and consume them, and also they tell us about some of the forces that shape reality for large portions of our population. Well now, children, tonight old Uncle Tom will want to tell you the real true story about Uncle Tom's captain. Now, uh, this is the... Contained in these cultural images is the history of our national conscience. A conscience striving to reconcile the paradox of racism in a nation founded on human equality. A conscience coping with this profound contradiction through caricature. What were the consequences of these caricatures? How did they mold and mirror the reality of racial tensions in America for more than 100 years? I know that video was definitely a lot, but after viewing it, do you still feel that signs and symbols lack the rhetorical power of persuasion? In looking at the myriad of signs and symbols that surrounded Southern Americans, in their kitchens as cookie jars, in the bedtime stories they read their children, or in paper print ads for matchboxes, do we not feel that these symbols may have played at least a small part? in maintaining a worldview that gripped the South for so long. In any society, we are constantly being steeped in a visual narrative that oftentimes has a viewpoint behind it. More so than anything else, this video is a dramatic representation of how unpacking meaning captured in objects and symbols isn't always a benign enterprise. Often, they are trying to convince us of something. When it's the denigration of a whole race, this persuasive influence is easier to see and identify. And this is why this excerpt from Ethnic Notions made for a great example. Images can be persuasive. And rarely are they innocuous. And I'm sure there's much more fodder here in this subject matter. But let's now pivot and use these newfound tools for uncovering implicit persuasion to a more subtle, modern-day medium like TV advertisements. If images can persuade us, now we take a look at the means by which they persuade. Do effects and digital manipulation make for more effective persuasion?